It is a great honor and a privilege to introduce Herman Weiser and Lucille Leaf. We found your beautiful apartment home in uh, Croydon <laughs> in England. And thank you so much for uh, giving us the time today. You're so, Herman, if you could tell us a little bit about where you were born and your family and how you came to stay with, um, with Lucille and her family, how you came to England. But a little bit of a background where you were born. Well, where I was born was Carpathian Hills. I don't know if you heard of it, Carpathian Hills? No. It's with the border with Hungary and yeah. Romania? Well, uh, originally it belonged to Czechoslovakia because the border is between uh, Poland, Romania, Czechoslovakia. But when the Germans took over Czechoslovakia, they gave Carpathia and the Hungarian. They took it over, and uh, and it's just where it was it the little village up in the mountain? There was nothing there. There was no cars. We now never seen a car, never seen anything. The ploughing was done by a cow. You know, like it's done in India, same way. We lived, you know, we had a bit of land, and as is um, say the son got married, father used to give him a bit of land. And that's how we lived because there was nothing. You had to grow everything uh, during the summer for the winter, storage for the winter. And when were you born? Do you know the date? 1932. Yeah. Uh, and your family, had your parents, were they for many generations in that area? Yeah, yeah. I don't know how long back, and I don't know how they built the houses, because when when I was born, the houses were done, because they had well, they had access, and and I can't see how they actually built the houses. Because you know, it's quite like like in Canada, they used to build the houses the same way, cut the tree down, and uh, and then they built house for that. And were you one of many children or? Uh, five. And your parents, did you come with a religious family or traditional? No, it was all, everybody was religious there. Absolutely, 100%. They did exactly what the Jews are supposed to do. Yeah. Um, they pray first thing in the morning with the throne and then in the in their pray in the evening and they pray every time they have a drink of water, every time they have a bit of bread they pray. They were absolutely like going back to Moses' time. That's how it was. Yeah. And what is your first recollections? What do you remember of growing up? Only when there was something bad happening. Uh, like when the when the weather used to come to kill the animals, you know, the shark. Then I remember things, but otherwise, you know, we just run around wild. There was nothing, you know, it's just woods. So, it's unbelievable, you know. Something people haven't seen, it's just a couple of idea, you know, and hills. Did, did you have a kindergarten or did you go to no, a, a, a primary school? We didn't even have a school. And um, they didn't have a hide either because they didn't have money to pay a rabbi. So did your parents teach you? Or how did you...? No, they, they didn't actually. I, mean, I was still quite young. I, I, I went... I was taken when I was only 10. When uh, these Hungarians actually took us, you know. And... Um, no, we just... Well, you know, I mean, he, only, all you had to know is how to survive, you know. You had to know how to grow enough food for you, for on the family, for yourself and the family. And that's what I, you know, that's what we did. I mean, I used to work when I was six and seven in the field. I cut a tree down when I was about seven. Yeah. I mean, it was like wild. 
Yeah, Herman, uh, where were you uh, with the children? Were you the oldest or in the middle? Or? I was the third oldest. And, uh, Michael was older than you, wasn't he? Oh, two years older, yeah. yeah. And there was two, I know, two sisters, and they were younger than me. And what do you remember when the Hungarians <laughs> came in? Do you, do you recall? When they come to get us, yeah. Well, it was quite a shock. <coughs> Sorry. That's the first time I've seen uh, a rifle. So they come in and they said, you've got to pack up so much food and you've got to be out within a, an hour. And they stayed there outside with the rifle and within an hour we had to go. And the whole so family? The whole family, everybody. And these were Hungarians? All the Jews in that little village, I think it's about <coughs> uh, 10 or 11 families. And it was Hungarians that came to round you up? Yeah, because they took it over from the Czech, well the German gave it to them. But it originally belonged to the Czech Republic, yeah. Okay. And can I just ask, what, did, what language did you speak at home? Yiddish. Yiddish. Hmm. Yeah, we just spoke Yiddish and uh, that's it. And <laughs> I mean, I suppose we live like the cavemen, really. <laughs> it's amazing that, you know. People don't realise it. How Did you have other relatives close to you, like aunts, uncles, grandparents? Yeah, I had a grandfather, grandmother, and her and her children, but it was quite a way. And um, but you had to walk there. When I did walk, a long, long walk. Because Mum said she you, remembered. You once told me that your grandfather had a spa or something. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And this, this is the one. I'm this quite. I don't know how far, but you know, I, mean, I, I used to walk when I was young, miles and miles, because I had to in your fair to see them. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, they, they do you remember the name of the village where you were from or where they were or you don't remember the names of the well, actual well, places? It was Bukovac, but I don't, don't know how to, where the village where I come from, Bukovac, and where my grandfather lived was so me. Actually it came out uh, where they're fighting, but it, it's not, it's, that's in Ukraine now, that's mm. the name, but it's, that's not the same village though. So me was where my grandfather lived. And when can I ask when the Hungarians came to round you up? It must have been a terrible scam. Um, did you have scary. any idea that this was going to happen? Was there any talk in the, in no. the village or? No, no, we didn't. We didn't get any news. I mean, there was no newspaper and there was no radio. We didn't get in, uh, any news. Um, so when they come up, we did hear from, from the other villages, like my granddad, who lived in the other village, much bigger village, and they had roads there, and they were taken quite uh, six months before that. But we thought, you know, they went there to work, nothing, nothing what really happened. So, you know, after that. Do you, did you ever find out what happened? Yeah, I know what happened. I didn't know at the time. It was the same what they went in the gas chambers. So we, when we got to uh, Auschwitz. So where did the Hungarians take you? Where did they first take you? Right, then they got an, uh, another village and there was like um, a ghetto for a long while, and I, I don't know how long we've been, but I can see my parents were getting thinner. So we were getting the food and they were not eating a lot. So we could, you know, you couldn't go and buy food. So whatever we took, huh? so you only be corn. And you used to mirror yourself and 
and do all you can. But there was nothing, I mean, that was there until we were loaded up on the train. We had to walk a long way to get to the train. Then we got a tr and then we got onto a truck, and then we got on the train, and that was like a three or four day journey. And of course, there was no water, there was nothing, there was no toilet. Uh, a couple old people died in there, and it was a very hot day. I just remember thinking, oh, they let us out if we come to water. And straight enough, one day we stopped right over the river. We could see, I could see the water, because we were in cattle trucks, so, you know, you could see down. And I thought they kind of let us out, you know. Still have no idea how bad things were. But they obviously didn't. And did you go with the whole family, your yeah. entire family? So, yeah, we were all put in the same truck and all that. But when we got to Auschwitz, it was like, could have been 2,000 people there on, on the train. And what greeted us was dogs. And they're screaming, rouse, rouse. And the dogs are like on two legs, ready, they want to jump on them. And everybody sort of separated. It was unbelievable. So I couldn't see my mum and dad, nobody from my family. So, and there was a line of people. And there was three SS men right at the front. And I walk around, I'm really, I'm right there. And uh, they were sorting out the people who could work and those who couldn't. And somebody from my grandfather's village, the man there, with a wooden leg, and he's selling, and he's showing them his wooden leg. He thought if he, you know, he'd get a easier work having a wooden leg, and all the three as has looking at it and I looked to the left and I saw my father, I ran over there, they didn't see it. Because if it wasn't for him, I would have been dead. Because, you know, the people went to the left of them, because they're facing their way, to the left, they went to the gas chambers, of course I didn't know that at the time. So when I looked over there, uh, I saw my father, I ran over there, they didn't see me, they were looking at his leg his wooden leg, and uh, then we stayed the night in Auschwitz, and they were moved out to another uh, camp. Uh, we were, uh, worked for a while, and then another camp, and then we finished up in Dora. Dora was the camp where they used to make the rockets, but it, that wasn't, that wasn't, that's where the camp was. But the, the, and where they made the rockets was. And who, can I just ask, when, when you came with a selection in, in Auschwitz, did you see Mengele? Did you, or? I didn't, you know, I didn't see him, luckily, I understand. I went over, I, I went over to my dad. He was selected to go to work. He was already, he already got there. And your mother say. and your sisters well, did? No, that's, all the women were, went to the left. And of course, I didn't know at the time, but half of us I knew what happened. They went straight. They lay immediately. The more they did after, I don't know, 40, something like that, they were killing them straight away. As soon as they come in, the ones who couldn't work, they were murdered. So Herman, it's, I'm sorry, it's a hard question, but from your family, who who survived? Myself um, and a brother, an older brother, he's two years older, and then he had a, a road accident on a motorbike, and he was killed on the road here in England. This, this is after but the war. This is after, after the war. Right here in England. And your father, did he survive? No, I, I was with my father for quite a while, and. 
in Dora, that camp, and so I used to give them a little bit of bread because I, I worked in the kitchen. Well, I used to, not in the kitchen itself. I used to peel the potatoes, and I would do a hundred liters of potatoes a day, which is a lot. I mean, it's you know, you know a hundred liters a lot, and if you didn't do it and properly. But I occasionally could pinch a uh, carrot or something. So I get the little bread we got. I used to get half to my father when we when we met at night in the in the barracks when we used to sleep. You know, you seen the the bed yeah. where you sleep, right? about eight or something, or nine on top. I used to give him that, and I used to give him a bit of bread when he used to go and wash your hand. And then he used to do the prayer beforehand. And one day he was ill and he went to the hospital. Well, I can't, couldn't go and visit him, but every morning I used to go out and have a look at the bodies. I mean, there was loads of bodies. They just used to take them out and leave them. And, uh, what do you call it? Um, like parade place, you know. They just used to they build them up like wood high, and I used to come and have a look, see if I see them, but I never seen them. And how old were you at this time? Uh, 13 or 12, time 12, I think, 12 or 13. Was uh, Michael with you then? No. No. I never saw him till. Uh, we got together in Czechoslovakia. Oh, no, after the war. After the war. So, did you, and what happened to your father? Did he survive in the yeah. hospital? No, I don't think. You never saw no. him. You never again. saw him again. No, no. So I was, um, then we, you know, I couldn't go and see him, and I shouldn't think anybody survived, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't. Um, Look after anybody, would they? Survive? No. Do you remember your parents' names? Yeah, my father's name is Mendel, and uh, Basia was my mum's name. Yeah. Uh, and, and your brothers? Do you remember the names of your your siblings? Yeah. Uh, so it was. Um, My, my oldest brother was Shulam and Mike and um, that was me and that was my sister, uh, Dwyer and Ruth. I've only sort of recently, uh, you know, I've been sort of thinking a lot about it and, and I've, you know, managed to remember the name. How did it feel that you were alone now, that you, you didn't know what happened to your father and you in the camp? <coughs> it can't, like, it, like everything, you got used to it, but at first, you know, I'm alone, uneducated, uneducated. I um, find a job and it's not easy, you can't read or write. And so, um, I've got a job and I did quite well at the job. I had several jobs and I did all right at the job because I was quite handy with my hands. So in the fin I finished up uh, doing maintenance in the hospital for quite a few years, doing maintenance. But that's after the war? After the war. But when you were in the camp and your father oh, yeah. was now in the hospital and you didn't know what happened to him. No. What happened to you? Did you continue? No, from that camp, now that was getting near the war, that was 1945, uh, we, <coughs> we were taken on the march, on the march. On the death march? No, I think it's a separate one. Well, it could be a death march because we only used to get 
a handful of potato, you know, boil on skin potato, and that was it for the day. And we kept marching and sl slept in the in the open, and it was uh, March, about April or near May, April, May, something like that. But it was fairly warm. We slept in it out, and one day we wake up. And I can see two Russian tanks right in front. And they were going um, shooting. They went into the woods shooting them. And I asked, one of the soldiers come out and he had watches and go from here to here. You know, he took the, the, the watches from the SS man, I presume. And then we were free. I don't know where to go. <laughs> no idea what happened, you know. Did it's someone take you under their wing, like no. an older person, or you were literally just walking along on your own with them? Like, was there an older lad who sort of said to hang by me because you'd lost your dad? Or you were just no. literally on your own? There was nothing like that. Were the Russian... When they liberated and you saw the tanks, did they come with food or did they... No, nothing. Absolutely nothing. And how did you know that they were Russian? Could you hear from their accents or... How did you know that the... the, the did you see the Germans fleeing? Well, I, I didn't know at the time that they were Russian. But then afterwards I realised okay. that, you know, I saw the Americans afterwards. And I saw a lot of prisoners walking that way. And there was a Russian guard and there was American guard on one side of the river where they met the Russians and the American met almost across the river. So I've seen a lot of people going that way. So I followed them. And when he came to the guard, he and the guard in uh, the Russian guard, and he said, where'd you come from? You know. And I'd I just hang hang on. There was some Italians I know that were pushing a, a little what um what do you call them? A little wagon, you know, maybe with stuff they collected. And they were pushing, I put my hand towards that and I'm you know, and so they when the Russian asked him where he came from, he's obviously said he was Italian, you know, from Italy, so they let us through. But if I'd have told him I was from Czechoslovakia, I wouldn't have got through. <coughs> you couldn't, you know, you, you had to stay on the Russian side if you come from from the east. And then then we got onto the American side and uh, they did give us a bit of food, they used to. And when you were in the camps, what did you do? You must have been starving. The, the food. In the camp? Absolutely. Really starving. Really hungry. You can't imagine. We used to get, uh, there was a loaf and I, they used to cut it into eight, or eight people. And uh, in the evening we used to get uh, soup. I mean, soup it is more like water. Maybe occasionally you might find a potato if you're lucky. And you survive. I mean, people are just. They used to drop dead. And uh, I've been in several camps, and I've seen them. They just walk and they drop dead. And I've seen one person who actually I don't know how or what, how he did it, but he uh, had a human, human flesh, and and then the, the had them walking about with a lump of wood to say what he did until he dropped, he couldn't do anything, then they shot him. And then, this is the war to the end of the war. There was, um, we didn't have anything for, for quite a few days and then a train came in and they opened the, he came into the camp, they opened the doors up and there was red, but he was gone green. And they made a rush. You know, you're so hungry, you can't imagine. Days, you know, it's not... 
one day, it was the day you were hungry, and they made a rush for the bread, although it was green, they shot two of them right in front of me, because I was just about to have a you know, go, and they shot them right in front, two of them. And that's how he went. And who were you? were not one of the youngest, because you were yeah. you were only twelve. Yeah, it's it's amazing that that you survived being so young in the in the camp. It's funny because where I was born and what we what we did. I mean, I was, you had to survive in Carpathia because there was nothing there. It's survival. So I worked on the in the field. And things, and I got strong, uh, and I'm more likely to survive than a grown up. And did you make any friends, or did you? Nothing. You don't. It, you know, you don't. People don't realize that you like release a wild animal when you were pent up in a camp. But then I, I, I don't know whether other camps did or people were older, mate, but I did not. No. But inside the camp? Yeah. Any friends or, like, you just fended no, for nobody yourself? Did. No, nobody even talked. No one, like, really watched you back? No. Oh, no. And did you get ill? Like, after the war, did you have to go to hospital or you just got your strength back? I, I was in the hospital in Czechoslovakia for a month. Um, how did just you, to build up my mind. Yeah. How did you get to Czechos? How did you get back? When after yeah, that's you, a very good question. <laughs> I like to know that. You don't know? Yeah. No. All I know, I remember, I'm on top of the train, because the lot, the train was completely full up, you know, and people were on the top. And I've got a little bag, and I presume there must have been food in it. I remember that, a little bag, food. Every, everything there, yeah. more, more, more food, you know. So I'm under a top. In the morning, I wake up. That was gone. Somebody's pinched it, and I'm so I'm on top of the train, and I finished up in Budapest. I was there for a while, and then I went to Czechoslovakia. And then my uncle found me. And did and you go by yourself? Yeah. yeah. All by yourself? You were in a strange city in Budapest by yourself? I was on the top of the train and going to uh, Czechoslovakia. I can't remember how that happened. Whether my uncle found me in Hungary, because mm -hmm. he went to the Salvation Army and they knew I was alive, and my brother and I. But the Germans kept a, a record of everything. In the Red Cross, the, they would have the, the list of those people that survived. No, actually, I think it was the Salvation Army he went to, if I think. It could have been the Red Cross, I can't and remember. And where was your uncle from? From the village? The, the, you know, from the bigger village, you know, bigger village. He survived because he was in the Czech army, so um, he survived. And do you because remember they were fighting with the Russians. Do you remember your encounter when you saw your uncle when he came? Do you remember that that meeting yeah. when you met yeah. with him? Yeah. It must have been very emotional when you met with him. I would say, you know, your emotions are gone. People, you know, it's. You know, you just haven't got any. I didn't. When I look at some on the, on the television, people aren't emotional, but I didn't have any. So that where I come from, right in the, you know, uh, wild man, really. It's like a wild man where I live. No, no emotion. But I, I know people were very emotional when they met. And did he take you back to, to your, the village? Or? No, 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 no. Never went back. Nobody went back. There's no, no point going back, really. Where, where, did, you, where did he take well, you? Well, I, I, fi I finished up. I was in the hospital for, uh, in Czechoslovakia for a month. 
and you know, I was, I was, I was given a lot of milk and all that to you know, bring me up, because I was on his skin and bone. So they. Do you know which town you were in Czechoslovakia? Were yeah, Slin. You, you ever heard Slin? I've heard the name. Yeah, you know, it's a amazing town. That belonged Bates' Shoe Factory. Do you know? You heard of it? Yeah, Bates' Shoe Factory. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my brother worked there and they used to have apprenticeships and they had all the houses for people who worked for patients. But they only made shoes, they made other things. They even made planes and motorbikes. And when did you meet your brother? How soon after? Was it after you came out of out of hospital? Yeah, well I met him in Zlin, yeah, when I was out in the hospital. He was there and then my Uncle took me to Selim. And how was the meeting when you met your brother? <laughs> you know, don't say. He was. There was no excitement. You know, the, everything has gone out of your. And did you realize when you met your brother that maybe you're the only two that have survived from your family? Yeah, I had a good idea. You know, I had a good idea. Well, I know. Then, by then, I already knew what happened to my mum and sisters, and I knew my father didn't survive. I never saw him out the camp. And when we left, I'd still, the day before, I looked and see if I could see him amongst the dead, and I didn't. So they. Um, I know he didn't survive, and I know my mum definitely didn't survive, and my sisters didn't survive. And my older brother, he went with my grandfather, you know, the first lot went. He, he, he stayed there with them, he used to help them uh, with the horses. So, I never knew what happened to him. So that's about it. And how long did you stay in Czechoslovakia and how did you come to England? Well then the Jewish Jewish organization got me to England and we got into uh, East London and the hostel, you know, a big building. Did you come with your brother? Yes, I did. And he joined, uh, after a little while, he joined the uh, Israeli Navy. So here, Lucille, how did, how did you land up with Lucille's parents? Oh, then, after, obviously, the hostel, you, everybody had to leave the hostel, and they find a Jewish family for, for us, for those, you know, for the people. Uh, and Herman, can I just ask, do you remember going from Czechoslovakia on, on a boat, coming to England? Yes, I do. I was so sick. Never, <laughs> never go like that. Oh, yeah. God, I'm really but sick. But were they, were they very welcoming and kind to you, the people that helped you come to England? I don't remember anybody. <laughs> I really don't. And did you know where you were going? Did you have any idea what England was? or? Did you know any English at that time? No. Well, luckily, it didn't take me that long. But I, I was when I come to you, I was always speaking English mm. quite good, wasn't I? But didn't Uncle Jack get you some English lessons with a, a neighbour of his that was an English teacher? So, I seem to remember. Lucille, can I ask you? Because this is something very special. Your family had taken in previously other survivors. Before, no, that was before the war. Before the war, yeah. they, but they had taken in other yeah. other Jewish refugees. Yeah, yeah. And where were you? Where were you living? Oh, I, I was. It was be, it, before the war. So mm. my parents lived in uh, Stoke Newington, in North London. And they took in they other took Jewish in refugees. Yeah. But I don't know. I don't know how it all. Happened. I do. It was grandma said it was a friend from Hammersmith Gold to someone who passed. She was 
I don't know what the charity was, but like the world, the refugee, what was it called before what the war? World, I, don't I can't know. remember, it was yeah. called the refugee, uh, Jewish refugee, yeah. and it was gold to someone uh, that grandma knew, she grew up in Hammersmith, and this lady walked past, grandma and grandfather had a news agent on Manor Parade, Stoke Newington, and this lady walked past, and grandma saw her, and um, oh, she came into the shop, whichever way it was, and she was living in the area as well. And she said she was looking for homes for refugees. Oh, right. So I don't know the names. Mum will tell you who came. Oh, yeah. there, well, there was a brother and sister, Walter and Lottie. And you know? there's, I don't know. Levy, their surname was. And they said. From? Oh, Vienna. Uh, I, need, I, I don't know where I they think were they from. from I don't know that they were, but anyway, they said at some stage that they knew this young fellow had just come out of a camp in Germany, this Max, and could he come? And my parents took this Max in. Walter and Lottie went off to America before the war, but Walter stayed with my parents. And Max, took, uh, Max this was also his name was Levy, Max Levy, he stayed there till the beginning of the war when all the they were interned as aliens and sent up to and how old were you at this time no that was before i, it's I before was you only i was born 1940 the war began in so this is before you were born yes but i knew max because after the war i met him you know and how did um, herman come to your home well it's i mean as i say it's all kind of yeah what my grandma used to tell us because i was a because child at the it. time but apparently in the jewish chronicle they had um would people offer homes to uh Survivors. you know refugee people you're coming out of the camps and my parents said they would they, they you know, got in touch and i think the camp or the whoever was organizing it they felt it would be a good place because we were young, three young children, but whether in actual fact it was so good because we were three dozy girls, weren't we? And my well, parents, young little one, yeah, one. but my parents didn't really understand how to look after a teenage boy, you know. But my great grandmother didn't really understand a teenage boy that wanted to bring his bike indoors. <laughs> <laughs> no, was it in the indoors? Yes, when you got shed. Yeah, it originally in the shed, but then you got a different bike and it was very special and you wanted to take it upstairs, but uh, that's the... Uh, but the point was, that's how Herman came to us, so... Um, but the interesting thing, if I may add, is that before the war, when my grandparents took in refugees, first of all, from a family point of view, you should understand that we weren't an affluent family. My grandparents were not affluent. They were newlyweds. They got married in 1935. They took a news agent and lived above the shop. 1937, uh, my grandmother's parents came to live with them because uh, my great grandfather was ailing and my great grandmother wasn't ailing, but physically she had very severe arthritis. So these young newlyweds have got their parents, the, the parents living with them and an ailing sister. My grandmother had a sister who was epileptic. So to take in refugees on top of that, was a pretty good deed and I'm sorry to say that a lot of wealthier or more comfortable Jews looked the other way. Not all of them but a lot looked the other way. It was also difficult to get the permits to come to England. We couldn't arrange permits and the same after the war where my grandparents were not wealthy at all. My grandfather wasn't an earner um, or big earner and they took in Herman, who stayed, as he'll tell you, much longer than the average sort of story. It wasn't just a, a sort of, you know, a three-month sojourn. And also, you should explain, because I didn't know Dr. Geller was with you. Oh, Dr. Geller, well, yeah. Do you remember Dr. Geller? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, tell them who he was. Oh, well, the local doctor, who was Jewish as well, he, he, I don't know how he got this Dr. Geller, who had hmm. been in the Russian camps, he hadn't been in the well, German camps. He, he, was, he was in the Polish army. Yeah, he, and then he, but he was in, in the Russian camps, wasn't he? Well, like as a prisoner as of a war prisoner rather of war. than as a Jew, right. Yeah. And then he married up, he'd lost his wife, he, did he have his, children as well? No, no, his wife had died, she was a dentist, she had died in Auschwitz. But Dr. Geller came as a sort of assistant to this Dr. Fry, who was the local yeah. Jewish doctor, and they wanted somewhere for him uh, to live. 
and my parents, as Jack has said, they weren't well off. My dad was a cabinet maker and um, they took him in as a lodger, so he lived with us. So we had Herman and Dr. Geller lived with us for a few, well, about two years till he was introduced to uh, a lady, a Polish lady who had come out of the camps, uh, Blanca, and they got married and then he moved out of our... Uh, but he stayed in Croydon all the years, Dr. Very Geller. Very well-known local Jew. Yeah, he was so, a lovely man. So yeah. I'd like to ask, when you first came to <coughs> to Lucille's parents' home, um, Lucille and you as well. How was the interaction? Did your parents ask you, do you mind if uh, refugees come? Or? No, we were only children. They didn't ask us. But were, but you, were you very happy? I can't remember. You just sort of were there, weren't you? But we all, it, I remember it as a happy time, um, didn't we? I mean, you know. Uh, and Herman, how did you feel in, in this family here in with with three girls and was it difficult to to just become part of a family or did they accept you very welcomely? I'm sure they must have. Well, they they uh, they did welcome me. A you became bit, part of I, the family, but didn't then you? then when I got a bit older, I went to the I joined the cycling club okay. and everything opened for me. You know, I I got friends and we used to right long 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 distance and I used to race as well and then I didn't have the freedom because when they sometimes they might have a party sometimes and I used to come when I used to about a night okay. honestly that was terrible I used to climb up the stairs because they used to be on my knees I can remember once you came in you came in the kitchen window to get in and the, but we, in those days we used to lock all the doors at night so the kitchen door was locked so he was in the kitchen i don't remember that yeah, he couldn't get out to his bedroom and, and Herman, did you go to school when no. you came uh, and I, when i started work when i was 15. oh he he helped martin you worked for a glass blowing factory didn't you uh, oh. I, you? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I had a several jobs. Yeah, Lo yeah. loads of. I, I started off in the garage. I did the garage. Yeah, I was motors, quite good, yeah. you know. And how did you learn English? You just picked it, it up. Just yeah. picked it up. No, no problem at all. Did you speak Yiddish to my <coughs> great grandma Lulu, or you only no, spoke no, English? No. There was By then, I already knew English. Mm, there was a big club here in this uh, in Croydon, Sir Philip. Uh, games club and Herman joined that club and he made friends and did all the got into the cycling didn't you? To Philip? Yeah it wasn't the club was the Philip Games Club wasn't it? That you oh joined? no that was boxing. Oh was that boxing? That was yeah. Oh yeah I remember. Yeah. That was uh, <laughs> a mistake. <laughs> <coughs> Didn't stay down very long. Yeah. <laughs> well Bobby probably thought it was very violent. No he, he one came home with like a cruet set because I think the other chap oh. hadn't turned up or something. You'd got the fight on kind of default and there was like a cruet set you bought. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I did. I didn't remember when I packed up because it was the police, wasn't it? The police uh, and there was a policeman there and he was like at least six foot. And he, he said, um, you and you together. And I'm, you know, I'm in there and I'm looking up and I said, that's it, that's, that's my help. <laughs> and I got in first, I hit him in the stomach and he just went straight down and I never went back after that. <laughs> how was, was a bit luck. How did you find it living in a home of a traditionally observant Jewish family? Because my understanding is with respect that by the time you got to them you didn't really want to know about going to shawl and such like. Well, I did go to shawl. Did you find it difficult or you just sort of fitted in with whatever? I just fit it in. I mean, to um, now, I was having a discussion with my rabbi whether there is a God or not. Whether there and is he said, God. I don't know, presumably. <laughs> no, he is very, very religious. Yeah. Yeah. But Herman, how, when you came to Lucille's parents' home, um, being reintroduced because you had missed out the years in the camps and 
and having Shabbat time, she had Shabbat. Yeah, so, yeah. how did you feel? Did did you feel part of it? Did you feel this is religion? Like, yeah. Well, you know, it's a bit difficult because I think you're a religious. You've given me all that. Um, well, I find it difficult that God would allow mm. six million Jews mm. and little children that have not sinned. Mm. I've got over and over that in my head and I find six million. Mm. When have you ever known God intervened in anything when the Jews been murdered in, uh, you know, in uh, Russia, in Russia and, and uh, the, the Ukraine and all that. I mean, I, in the film, I've got to watch it because I think, you know, I should see what's ha what actually happened to her. And there's a Ukraine, when the Germans come in, a U an, old, an old guy is left, picked up a lump wood and he's hitting a Jew to death to the floor and the Germans are laughing. Mm -hmm. God is looking. When I, when I saw that, that definitely turned me off. I thought it's sure, but doesn't mean I have to believe. No, it's not uh, mean to it's see a Jew being mm. beaten to death with a lump of wood, mm -hmm. and there the German soldiers are laughing. No, you're probably the same as me. I would say I'm culturally Jewish, not religious. I love going to shul, but I don't. I'm not a great believer. I like to well, be amongst to, Jewish people. I'll go there because they treat me quite nice. Yeah, yes. no, I it's have a, uh, my ninetieth birthday. They give me a really terrific birthday. The ninetieth birthday. Yeah, that's me. And Herman, when you were in England, did you ever encounter any anti-Semitism from any of the British or? Or did well, they particularly know you were Jewish? Well, I was going to say that, you see. The first thing I did, I changed my name to John. So, and I didn't look, I don't look particularly Jewish, I don't think. So people <coughs> didn't know. But I did hear now and again, you know, grabbing Jews, you know. They, yeah, so if, even if not directed to you, it was what was said generally. Yeah, I heard them discussing, you know but not that bad, not really, not, it's not as bad. And then I just, I thought, it's ridiculous. You know, you know when you come out of something terrible, you don't want to be, identify yourself with uh, being a Jew. You're not, you're, you know, I was scared, really. And can I ask, with your brother, where did he stay when he came to England? Well, he went in the Navy for a while, and then he got married. We come come out of the Navy, got married, and he was living in Tilbury. And were you close with your brother? Did yeah, you? Well, I used to go and see him at least every two weeks. Or, uh, so, yeah. And did you discuss with your brother the camps no, and no, the, no. The, the Holocaust? What had happened? He's on this well, I don't never discuss. I don't even other people. Don't, why would they want to discuss a thing like that? But with your brother, did you did you speak about what you went through? No. no. And he, he never asked. He never asked, and I never asked him. That's who he was. He was. I don't know. It was something you didn't talk about. Nobody talked about it. Mm. I didn't realise that. But I when I went to. Uh, um, Nightingale, you know, you know Nightingale. No. Night Nightingale House is a a Jewish uh, um, old age home. A, an old age home in South London, and they they had a, a group there for Holocaust survivors. The Holocaust survivors, survivors. Uh -huh. and Herman got involved with them. Well, they had a, a group there for survivors, and discussion once a, a week. I used to go there. Um, no, I forgot what it was. I was. Uh, and did you discuss with the survivors? Did you, did people open up, or did they discuss their experiences? Well, then, then they were talking, and then I, that's when I found out 
that nobody talked for 50 years, mm -hmm. not only me. Yeah. I don't know. It's a lot. You did, put a lid on it. Ever, well, because people didn't want to hear it. Did you ever discuss... Oh, that's very true yeah, as well. true. But did you ever discuss with Lucille's parents what had happened to you? Mm, or No, not particularly. You never spoke to Lucille's family or... Because in those years, people didn't talk, rightly or wrongly, people thought, um, you know, get on with your life, like, forget yeah. about it. It was only more recently when people realised that you need to talk it, you know, also, you can't the, bottle it all up. But in those years, nobody spoke about the it. The internet's changing, we didn't have the information. So our own family, my great-great-grandfather, who died of natural causes here in 1943 he had five sisters with their children grandchildren and great-grandchildren in Warsaw at the beginning of the war and my grand my great-grandmother had a, a first cousin a wealthy lady who lived next door the Dorchester and she went straight after the war to Poland to find family she found nothing mm. but we've always been told that really she went too soon because it was a pandemonium Sadly, I've been trying recently to find, she died childless and there's no records, I, if only I could find a list of names of who she was looking for, there'd possibly be records now. Who knows, there might have been a little kid of an age with Herman that might have survived and been taken off to America, we've got no idea, I don't even, wouldn't know who we're looking for. I've done my DNA and nothing's come, you know, we've, so who knows. And that's just one part of our family, there's other parts you know, all the immediate family were in England, but there were more distant people, of course, that were it's only caught in, up. In more re recent years, that, you know, people realise um, you know, like the psychological effect that people need to talk, but straight after the war, nobody spoke. And when they talk about second generation survivors, some of whom you've interviewed, my sisters would disagree with, not disagree, not in a nasty way, but they conduct their lives very differently, and my brother to me, I would say that I've got not a survivor's uh, complexity because strictly speaking we're not survivors, my immediate family were here, but my extraordinary interest or degree of interest in the Holocaust, I do feel a survivor's guilt because my mother has, I don't know if she'll move on to it or whether it's appropriate, but my mum's recollections of the war as a little girl in Croydon because they got bombed out of Stoke Newington. Um, it wasn't a bad war, they didn't have food deprivation. Mm. She did her, her great acting performances on top of the, was it Morrison or Anderson Morrison Shelter? Shelter. Uh, her great acting debut, it finished in 1945 her acting. <laughs> um, resurrected briefly at the West Central Club in The Boyfriend I suppose. No, that was Daddy, not me. Oh right, um, but the point is in all seriousness, uh, she had a good war. My dad had a less good war, he was pushed from pillar to post as an evacuee. But I feel guilt, or when I first became interested in Holocaust, I feel very guilty, thankful, but guilty that we didn't suffer. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if that was the same for your family, Les, but I, I really feel that although I identify with the Holocaust, we were having a reason, you know, my grandfather went off to the army, but even that, people were off at Monte Casino and goodness knows what. My father was in, was it Kettering or Kettering, what's Kettering. the place called? And he was make, he was a cabinet maker, he was making toys and bringing them home on 24 hour passes. It, 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 his war injury was a broken nose in a cricket match. So we had a very different war to what Herman went but through. I, but what I think is extraordinary in your family and that your family took in survivors before the war and after the war. And anyone who says they didn't know what was going on before the war, they are either stupid, lying or in denial. They did know. We might not have known the full extent, but my grandmother saw the refugees at the kitchen table squeezing diamonds out of toothpaste or whatever it was, if I'm not, or along those lines, like how they were smuggling jewels out. But I have to say, my grandmother also said that the refugees weren't necessarily very grateful because when they were squeezing out the diamonds, they didn't say, in here, Ruth, you have one. You know, they used my grandma for what she was there for. So it, it's, it's a very complex situation mm -hmm. because the German, Austro-German, Hungarian refugees were generally a pretty snooty bunch compared to us Pollocks and such like, you know, it, it's, it wasn't a match made in heaven really. <laughs> but looking back, um, Herman and Lucille, 
having a survivor in your home and you growing up as a how did you get on with each other? How did you... No, we don't know. It's the older brother. There were only children. Yeah, it was the older brother you always wanted. We, we were children. I can remember to, Herman to taking me to the local swimming pool, trying to teach me to swim, which wow. he never succeeded. Mum still can't doing. swim. <laughs> yeah, I still can't swim. Um, or ride a bike. <laughs> or ride a bike, no. Uh, no he, <clears throat> did I tri try to teach me a bike? Ride a bike? Not to ride a bike. You tried to teach me to swim. But no, not no, to ride the bike. I, I vaguely remember that. But we, um... But it was I part mean, of an extended and, family. And, and Croydon was Piccadilly Circus and you were loved by all the family. Yeah, and and how, how long did you stay in... in well, you, when did you come together? about 1947, didn't you? Yeah, I think I and left in 58. In 50, so that's yeah, really... Yeah, when my, um, my father was ill at that time and that's when Herman left. And Herman, you felt part of the family you felt that they like adopted child in the family yeah I mean the thing is um, you know I, I, I wasn't educated you know like if you're at home and you grow up and then you it's time to leave but I wasn't ready for anything like I wasn't ready for outside if you know it's just you know where have I been in the past and and I just wasn't ready. And they said, you've got to leave. So, you know, I'll find a place. And I left. But you were there for how many years? 11 years? 11 or 12 years, like yeah, yeah. Something like that. And Herman, can I ask, did you ever have nightmares? Or did you have a lot of difficulties can, that um, you went through? In the beginning, I used to see the camp in my brain, you know. I didn't actually have nightmare, but I could mm. see it, you know, in my dream. And then I stopped dreaming altogether. I don't remember any dreams after a while. Nothing. You've never been back, you've never gone on these trips to the camps, you've never been back, no? At, at the early stages I, I did for a, two or three times, and then it stopped. And I don't remember any, obviously they say everybody dreams, I don't remember any dreams no, at all. I never remember dreams, actually. And Herman, did you ever feel that you wanted to speak to somebody, to go to a rabbi to speak to, or a teacher, just to offload what you had gone through, or...? Well, the Jewish care, they got a, a psychiatrist, and I've, and I've been I was seeing him for uh, quite a while, but they don't do anything. But Absolutely when, nothing. When did you first? I mean, when you were when you were still a, a boy and then a teenager. In those days, did you feel you wanted to go and see somebody or or speak about it to anybody? No. You bottled no. it all up. In no. Herman's defence, nobody did. Nobody, I know nobody did. Nobody it's, it's went, my father should have had counseling for totally different uh, reasons. I mean, nobody when, went when I went to the school, it was quite interesting how I got back to the school. So it's like a, a bit of a miracle. It's like 40 years later, I'll come uh, with her the younger sister. I, I went to uh, Croydon. Um, town hall for uh, remembering today. Why did you go? Why did you go to that meeting at Croydon Town Hall? What, the, what you just fe felt you wanted to go? Remembering. I know, but why? Why not? Why not? Well, I should do, shouldn't I? I was there, and I should. <coughs> but nobody approached you. I mean, you you went of your own accord. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 No, nobody passed me. No. And, uh, no. So that's four, at least 40 years mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. I left. So and someone came over to my aunt and said, there's a Jewish gentleman over there, and Auntie Baylor knew everybody in Croydon, so thought she must know this man, no, no, and no. went over and... It wasn't quite like that. Oh, go on. So, right, um, after the speeches was downstairs, mm -hmm. We got up the stairs and you sit down and that was shown 
they was going to show a, a picture of Auschwitz. So they opened up and they saw the, the entrance to Auschwitz and where you come in with the train. So without <coughs> actually thinking, I mean, it was so... Uh, Emotional. Uh, yeah, like a, somebody punched me seeing that. I said, I was there. And I said, were well, you really there? So I said, yes, I, I was there. So he got and told his wife, and the wife, his wife, was Baylor's friend. And, and she told Baylor, and Baylor said, asked his name. Ah. Uh, Baylor was my sister. Wow. Yeah. And uh, that's how I got back, and I got back to the school, and she changed my name back to her, I and mean, she <laughs> said, I know, I know her, I mean, it's her, and that's it. No John. <laughs> so everybody in the school. Mind you, I had to travel in the school when I was talking about it. At that time, they said you should talk about it, talk about it. So in the school, I, wanted, I, I was telling them what happened to me, and they didn't want it. They got quite upset, annoyed that I was talking to them about it. Did they? They did, yeah. So one of them said, you're not the only one who lost, who lost her parents and all that. He said, I had a grandfather in Russia. He died. You're not the only one. I was there, and, and he's talking about a grandfather or somebody mm. in, in Russia, and he got quite... But that would have been presumably a grandfather that he never no. knew. Well, no, you were right. robbed of your yeah. parents that you lived with. It. And, he, and, and he lived through it as well. Honestly. Yeah. And, and it, it took me <coughs> quite a while yes. to tame them, you know. Yeah. I was determined they should know what happened. Mm. Yeah. And then they did do a little, uh, you know, it's not, you know, it wasn't very good. But <laughs> uh, tried to, they tried to do the same what you were doing. And Herman, can I ask, in, in these years, did you ever read books about the Holocaust or, or watch films on television no. about the Holocaust? Were you ever interested in 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 reading or what happened when well, the film I, came I, up or would you watch it or? I, I watched some of um, on the internet. Um, I watched some of that when I think I should know exactly what other people went through. But it's uh, you know, Look, so you, you learnt, you taught yourself to speak English, but you weren't taught to read and write English. No. This, no. Is, no. this is what people don't realise. It's true. Um, you know, he lost his whole education. Yeah, I mean, uh, at least about the work and everything. You haven't got, you know, I, I did it all wrong, you know. I should have gone to evening classes. I did for a while, and then they shut it. They couldn't afford it. The evening class and stuff and and then I didn't when I got married and all that I was working unbelievable hours but I had two jobs at one stage two jobs and you know it just wasn't time for me to do anything just work especially when I got the children and, that. and did you ever tell your children about what happened to you do they know at all? Well, they were uh, would they not? They guess, they guessing, they guess what happened. Yeah, they they don't know. I never told them. I didn't. I never, never told my wife. She knew something strange happened to me. You know. Did and, she ask? And, and she told yeah. the children, <laughs> "Don't ask him any questions about the war." Yeah. Did she ever ask you? Did your wife ask you? Or? No. No, no. And you didn't feel you wanted to tell her? No. Why load up more? I mean, she had enough trouble in her own year. She suffered with depression really bad. So why load more? It won't help me much, and it won't help her. So what, it's, there wasn't much point telling people, oh. But I didn't want to tell the people in the, in the school you know and they were quite against except the rabbi and uh, I got him on my side and then 
he got married and his wife was really fantastic. And you feel part of the community? Yeah, especially since his wife come and we get on really great, you know, wow. really good. And Herman, how was it when you met uh, Lucille again after all these years, mm -hmm. when you were reunited? Yeah, well, I met her. Um, well, it was we met previously at it, it was my mum's 80th birthday yeah. and we were making her a party and we said um, we wanted to contact people she'd worked with and you know, not just for the family, for all these people. And then we just said, wouldn't it be nice if we could contact Herman? And Where is he? Baylor still like, lived in this area and in those days you still had telephone directories. Yeah. And um, Baylor looked it up and there was like this Jay Weiser <laughs> and we said it, it must be Herman and Baylor phoned you, didn't she? And then That's amazing, that many, many years after. Yeah. That was 1994. Yeah. And, yeah. you, and you came to the... Uh, well, so then we said, we, we better have a sort of get-together before Mummy's party. So uh, Herman came over to my sister, lived in um, Croydon, and we, uh, my elder sister and myself, myself and our husbands, we went over, and then we met Herman. And how and was that, that encounter? It was, it was... How many years were you, hadn't you oh, seen well, each other? 58 to 94. Yeah, it was a long it's time. It's a long time. So, 36, was it? 58, 94, yeah. yeah. And Herman, how was it emotional, it must have been emotional, well, that meeting, when more, you... More of a surprise. <laughs> yeah. yeah surprise. <laughs> you know, somebody rings up, and, you know, invites me, uh, yeah. to the party, but, but 80th it, party. But during all that time, like I was born in 1970, and alright, I'm family obsessed anyhow, but we always heard about Herman. No, we always heard. That Herman was like the older brother that mum never had, yeah. and she always talked about him in these glowing affectionate terms, so it wasn't suddenly that 1994 yeah. comes and this bloke pops up and who the hell is he? We always knew about Herman, and we'd always wanted to meet him, so it was lovely when we all met up. Your mum was really surprised. She was, yeah. <laughs> she must have been so happy. So. Yeah, no. That, that we, made her her, her well, eighth birthday party. We, we um, yeah, it, it was lovely. It just so happened that um, Mummy's birthday was sort of on a Saturday, so and we used to go to school, so we had to. We had to tell her we were doing something, but she didn't know what. So we arranged for friends to look after mum, take her to shawl and everything on that particular Saturday yeah. while we were getting this party ready and there was Herman and there were some of the people that mummy had worked with and whatever this whole surprise party and all the family and it was a lovely and she was surprised yes yeah. and um, yeah it was it was lovely it was yeah <laughs> but, of course my grandma had died by then you know but, uh, but there were cousins that, uh, that were there at that party, like Martin and that, that had remembered you, mm -hmm. and Yvonne, and, that and, that, and it was Martin and Yes, yes. So, and then he went to Israel. He, 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 he eventually, yeah. He ended up in Israel, yes. And Herman, what happened to your brother? Did he, he move to Israel? No, no. No, he, I said he, had, uh, he, he was living in uh, Tilbury. He got married there, and he's lived, he was living there, and. When he was coming back from work, oh, he had he a motorbike and he had an accident on the motorbike. We don't oh, yeah. actually know what happened. How old was he? He's only two years older than me. No, when he passed away, when he... I was... I was for, uh, you still was about... Yeah, no, no. 40, something, mm. yeah. A, a, long, some, a long time ago. He was, he was only two years older, so... Mm. Terrible to go through the war and then that should happen. And Lucille, yeah. do you remember... No, all I remember... Do you remember him coming to visit? Michael, did he? Suddenly he'd phone, he'd come into port or something, yeah. and suddenly he'd phone with his soul. Yeah, Herman, Herman, and Michael's on the phone. You know. And did he come yeah. and visit? Did once or twice. I don't remember a lot about him. He came once or twice, mm. but he was... But he used to no, phone I, I, when I he came to, into I, I used wherever. to see him very yeah. regular. Yeah. At yeah. least every two weeks. And from your whole extended family, is was your brother the only okay. s survivor you had in your brother? 
and my um, uncle, your uncle, yeah, but he he uh, immigrated to America. Oh, was that the one? Mm -hmm. And were you in touch with him? You remained in yeah, touch. Yeah, right. And he used to send me pocket money every month or week. It was pretty good, very good, much better than I was to him. <laughs> So your uncle, he was the one that reunited you with yes. Michael, yeah. Yeah. See, I mean, he was more educated, so you know, he was in the army, and he um, he was an officer actually of some kind. So I had a photograph of him. Um, so he, you know, he he done quite well, and then he went to he went to America, got married, had children, and I had one of the children come here on his son. And then that's it really. and then he died. But none of your family had left Europe before the war? No one that you know of? No. So there's no photos that survive anywhere that, like of your parents or anything? No. And did you ever have a desire to go back? Wait, where I lived? Yeah. No. And it's no good going back, is it? No, because I, I met um, somebody in um, Nightingale. They lived in a bigger place, but it's still Carpathia. And she went back, and they ha she had a terrible, terrible reception. She said, why you come back? You know, the village is there. And uh, she said, well, I just wanted to have a look at my house. We don't want you here. Get out. On mm -hmm. on 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 another case, I saw it on television in Poland. Yeah. The woman is making a film, and she said, "Ah, uh, we're going to see now where I used to live." She knocks on the door. Door. The woman opens. What do you want? She said, "I used to live in this house. We just want to have a look." You can't shut the door. That was in Parliament. Yeah, they think you're back to claim it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, there were actually Jews that went back to Poland and some were killed. Well, actually. This is actually on, on the, um, you, you know, um, somebody made a, we're making a film like you are, and they followed her, mm -hmm. and she said, well, we come and have a look where I lived, the house. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't let her in. And so did this other woman who lived in Carpathia. They told her to get out of the village, you know. I mean, those people, they you cry in, and they are not very nice people. Yeah. You know, where I live, they could, you know, they, you cry in, and they weren't very nice people. Pretty rough people, you know, I mean, it's a rough life anyway. Yeah. And Herman, are you happy that you came to England, looking back? Oh yeah. I mean, obviously, I mean, where else would I be, really? Did you ever feel you wanted to go to Israel? No, I did uh, I never thought about it, no. I didn't uh, realise what they were doing. In the early days, I mean, they weren't doing very good, were they? I mean, uh, the State of Israel, was well, 1958. 48, 48. 48, I mean, oh yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah, but you would come out the camps from one hard life straight to yeah, another yeah. hard life. Mm. So maybe you needed, you needed a, a after youth. what you had gone through, to have a loving family to look well, after that, you. That wasn't loving in Israel neither. For, it for was them. hard, it was, was hard. hard it was, uh, Not, but actually, as far as I, I've heard, that wasn't very, uh, you know, they didn't like the ref you know, the no, survivors, no, they no, didn't I, like them. No, no, not completely, they were, it was difficult, but they were, they were, they, many came, the whole country was mm, built up. They, but again, they, they, they were built up But they survivors. didn't like, originally, they wasn't liked. You're right, I mean, yeah, according no. to your own testimonials that have been recorded, <laughs> excuse me, they, not so much they didn't like them, but they didn't want to hear, well first of all they didn't want yeah. to hear the stories and secondly they thought they were like lambs to the slaughter. Yeah. 
So whereas now we call them survivors, I think they thought when they were arriving, they're a bit of a motley crew that had sort of, as they'd just gone with the flow, they hadn't put up much of a fight, well, as if you could have put up a fight. Well, immediately after the war, anyway, it was still under the mandate. Yeah. Yes, I mean, Israel saying, wasn't you couldn't, country. you couldn't come. Yes, but everyone thought it was lambs to the slaughter, as if but you, you know, know what the sad thing, there were many survivors that did come mm. and they had to go into the, the War of Independence. Yeah. And you see... Uh, at the graves, many died in the War of Independence. Well, I didn't realize. They came from the camps to fight. And, and until I watched your own story, the testimonials, I didn't realize how many Jews had come out the camps, gone to Palestine, and then got their visas for America. I don't know what the number of but a huge amount went from Israel. Whereas, I, you know, I always thought you went to Israel, you stayed there, but no, a lot went on, particularly to America. I don't know if that's good or bad. But I think where you were lucky is that you were adopted or fostered, whatever word you want to use, but taken into a very loving home. Yeah. A home full of women that didn't understand a, a young man, that's true, but there was a lot of love. Yeah. Everything I hear about Bizards and Roads, it was just, oh, it was yeah, utopia, so it was a very happy home, and there was all the family coming because Croydon is midway between London and Brighton as well, so it's a very convenient toilet stop on a day yeah. out. and. Um, you know, they weren't a wealthy family, but mum says there was always food galore, a platter of fried fish, always on the go. And so Herman was involved in all of that. You went to family weddings and uh, celebrations. You, you were made to feel part of the family. Yeah. It's but a, the family a, didn't understand this young man that I suppose must have been angry for want of a word, or, or angry or frustrated, because they didn't understand what he'd gone through. Yeah. No, this, uh, um, well, I didn't understand families neither, you know. Uh, they wouldn't allow me coming in late. Mm. That was, you know, um, 18, 19, something like that. Uh, how old was I before yeah, I left? Yeah, well, this is it, that you were a, a teenager, like, wanting his freedom, and particularly my uh, grandma. I mean, grandma. she was a, absolutely a, a lovely, lovely lady. But she wouldn't have understood and she would have expected him to um, be, home, be home, home and say where yeah. he was going, you know. She didn't understand a teenage boy or yeah. in his early 20s, so it was but unfortunate. The, and my dad was an extremely quiet man, so he, and also he was working all the time, but he was very quiet, wasn't he, my dad, you know. Yeah. And, um, Too quiet. He, <laughs> he was a very quiet man. And um, so really, it, it, with the best will in the world, yeah. they didn't understand. But you know. they did what they did without psychiatrists, without oh, psychologists. they did it for all the best and they of did, reasons. And they did it because they wanted to help. And I think it's extraordinary yeah. what your family yeah, they, did. They did it and for it's extraordinary that you stayed for all these years. Yeah. It's, it's wonderful. And what should also be remembered on this recording is that they weren't wealthy people. No, they didn't really do important. it. Yeah. They weren't paid to do no. it. And no, they were paid. Pardon? They were paid. Might have got a stipend, but it wasn't like a bit of business. They weren't. Uh, they weren't profiteering out of it. Um, it. It was done, you know, as a, a for love and as a sense of a duty. It's a mitzvah. Yeah. My grandmother, I didn't know my grandfather, but my grandfather, uh, my grandmother instilled in me, um, you know, the importance of, uh, I wouldn't say charity, but duty, mitzvah, well, you helping, know, things that you should uh, do. So I would like to ask, um, Herman, we'll ask with you first, what, what message can you give to what? the, what message can you message, give message. To, to your children, grandchildren, future generations? Because you've really seen epic things, you harrowing and epic things. You've seen the you've you've seen the worst, and you've seen also the revival of the state of Israel. You've seen so many different. You've witnessed history, well, and uh, you've been uh, part of it. It's really difficult. Uh, well, I I don't know if you see things becoming bad make sure you do something about it you know mm. like we should have done but we couldn't we didn't know but now anything bad has happened to the jews in particular you've got to make sure you get together and fight it and don't let it go like it 
you know, when when I when I was young and the Germans come, they didn't have a clue about fighting back, and they didn't have, they never seen a gun for a start. I never seen a gun. Nobody in, in the villages where I live seen guns. Uh, so it's difficult, but as soon as you see any problem, try and deal with it. Don't let it fester on and on until it becomes a big explosion. That's the best I can do. And Lucille, if I could ask, what message do you give? You know, having been in a home where, you, where your family took in survivors? Well, it wasn't just that. I mean, um, my family, were, they, were, they were good people. I mean, even uh, nothing to do with the war, just with family, etc. They've always been very um, caring, involved sort mm -hmm. of people. Um, I mean, we weren't sort of... Uh, we were traditional kind of Jews, you know, but the Jewish aspect has always been very important within our home. And um, they were kind of good people, but I don't think they... It's hard to put it into words, really. Um, Your message to the future generations. What, what would you tell us kids and your grandchildren? Behave yourself. Behave yourself, yeah. You know, help where you can, do good, don't do harm, you know. Um, well, can be, I put be tolerant of no, everybody. Jackie, I think you, you actually said... Jack's better with I'll words You actually I said something very, very, very important. I'll put yeah. words into Mum's mouth because I was seven and a half when my great-grandma died. I remember her, but I don't remember all... Her. She was very matriarchal and she was very strict but very fair. And... <clears throat> all the family, I've never heard a bad word said about Auntie Lulu. <clears throat> now, she ran a very kosher home, but she wasn't a shawl goer. And she, uh, I believe, she, Mum will correct me, I believe she said, if you're a good person, you're a good Jew, but running to shawl, you know, saying all your prayers doesn't make you a good person. They can be empty words. And I believe very strongly. So I'm the next generation down, and I would say be v I'm very proud of my Jewishness anybody that meets me within five minutes they know I'm Jewish I'll never hide it I wear it as humor as well you know my sisters always sound like Maureen Lippmann and I think it's funny um, so I've always been very involved in Jewish communal life um, I'm an ardent Zionist and it, if Israel is not my physical home it's my spirit it's a spiritual home I've truly got divided loyalties Mum's convinced I'll end up in Israel. I'm not convinced. Um, uh, although I'll be there next week on holiday. Um, so support Israel. It's very easy, particularly in the, these times, um, to be critical of Israel. There's enough non-Jews to criticise Israel. We can be constructively critical, but we shouldn't just criticise it uh, for the sake of criticising when you know that it's going to go outside the community and it's going to be misquoted. Um, so it's to stand close and tall and proud with Israel. And when people say, oh, I don't belong to a shul or I don't go to shul, as Herman and I have both said, you don't have to be from yeah. to go to shul and you don't have to be from to belong to a shul. And... Oh, my grandmother instilled with me that you pretty much pay your shawl bill before you pay your gas and electric and I've always had a shawl membership and the structure of shawls in this country if memberships are not paid the shawls can't be funded and they will close they are closing and we are being destructive to our own people by not supporting our shawls so that's my message for my nephews and niece Oh, yeah. uh, that's very true. People are not support. No. The Jews are not support in the synagogue. So I just want to thank you. I'm going to just come in. Um, well, so Herman and Lucille and Jack, I'm so appreciative. Herman, really, this has been such an honour and a privilege. It really has. 
and okay. um, okay. it's just amazing to hear your story. You really, I think it's it's incredible, and you see what your family did, and it's 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 wonderful to see that people cared for you after the war because you went through enormous difficulties and. Thank God you're here and 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 healthy and, healthy and well and um, you should just continue to be well and have all of Hashem's blessings and I know there are many questions and we don't have the answers but another question is where was the whole world when this was all happening where was Europe where were the where was the whole world how did they l allow it to happen in the most cultured country in the world there are many Can I questions. say something? Sure, but where, where? I just want to thank you so much, really. Okay. okay. No, 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 no. They don't. They didn't want to know because it is affecting the Jews. They were all happy about it. Mm. Most of them, the majority, were happy. Yeah. I mean, they didn't. They didn't worry about Jews being killed. Mm. In fact, they enjoyed it. But there were good. There were many that did help, and there were righteous Gentiles, and we we They're must be grateful few. for everybody I'm who's helped. Yeah. Yeah. The yes, big. but the Russians get a bit of a pretty bad press and, you know, we say if it wasn't for the Yanks we'd be speaking German, but the Russians were, yeah. were good for us for the war. No, they did, they, they liberated us. And Churchill didn't bomb the railway lines and people say if it wasn't for Churchill we wouldn't be here. Well, true, if it wasn't for Churchill we wouldn't be here, but Churchill did not win the war for the Jews, it, it was just that the fact that he won the war, so... It we was also Roosevelt. Roosevelt. Well, Roosevelt was worse. But I mean, Churchill's, there's quotes in history where <laughs> it wasn't Jew friendly. British aristocracy's not, and it probably still isn't. Still, I, I, I said that in the synagogue that Roosevelt wasn't good for the Jews. No, no. No. They, yeah. thought, they thought I was out of my mind. No, but I mean, even with Princess Margaret's mother in law was Jewish, where do you ever hear that talked about? You know, you have to keep it quiet. And also, British Jews. Our survival is we keep our heads down. That uh, you know we're not like American Jews. We we keep keep your head down and keep yeah. a low profile is the way. Yeah. And it's not necessarily the right way, but that's how in, it is. In this country, Jews change their name, their surnames. In America, they didn't. You know, it's just the way it is in England. You so Lucille yeah. Cohen was really Lucille Dobzhinsky. <laughs> really, well, that's but, another but story. Lucille, I, I really must say this: that it's that for me personally to see a family that did take in refugees, as Jack said, it's a pity that more families didn't. Yeah, yeah. And your family wasn't affluent and they did yeah. the right thing. Well. And I think the most amazing message from this is that when you have people that really care about others, it really makes a difference. And even now, with all the crises in the world, we've got World Jewish Relief. Um, Interestingly, when the Ukrainian crisis start, the current crisis started, and I contacted World Jewish Relief and offered my home or hospitality to Ukrainians, and I don't mind this being on record, I eventually heard back, we're not looking in your area. That's Leon C next to Westcliff, which is affectionately known as God's waiting room. It's the Miami, of, you know. Um, I thought, I was absolutely disgusted. And as Herman alluded to, I don't know how much Ukrainians have changed between then and now, but I didn't want a non-Jewish Ukrainian in my home. So I contacted another charity and I had an Afghanistani refugee who was a wonderful young lad and it's a story in itself. But Jewish people could be in this country, I don't know what they're doing elsewhere, but they could be doing a lot more for refugees. They could be doing a lot more financially to support Israel and indeed Jewish charities in this country that are crying out for money. Jewish people, um, it's the pro we, British Jews are very in favour of assimilation. The First World War assimilated those funny little foreign boys into British gentlemen, British soldiers and the cost of assimilation is what we're going through now. Um, and it's very worrying times, not just for Manset, but worrying times for ourselves. We're almost self-harming, um, and I don't know the answer to that. In Israel, a lot of, and this is amazing, a lot of um, Ukrainians wanted Israeli passports because they could be saved, and many were taken to Israel, and they've been very, very well accepted. My wife teaches in a school where there are many Ukrainians and Russian mm. children that have been brought to the country, and they're very well accepted. 
but um, I just want to thank you all it's been the greatest honor and a privilege and to see you both together and see the families and really it's a reunion yeah. and it's wonderful that you made this reunion and it's, it's wonderful that you kept this connection all these years and you should just all be well and healthy and I really appreciate you giving your time and sharing thank you very much Herman. you live in Israel and you, and you come here just what to see friends yeah and fa we got family here and uh, oh, and it's just so how did you learn about me through Jack who has okay. been uh, an amazing supporter and and I really appreciate it. And, and what, really happened, what happens to the film? I'll, I'll, it's going to go viral. I'll give, I'll give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's really wonderful that we, we cannot have it. And, you know, and people can really learn from what you went through. And you're such an example for all of us. Do you still really. speak Yiddish or you've forgotten it? Forgotten. Forgotten it. I can still, if somebody says the word, can I, can, I can understand it. Well, but this is 100 Yeah. <laughs> In good health and and muscle and broken. Thank you so much. And Zach isn't. It can't get. This is the house where you lived and where Herman came to. Who was in which? What the? Who's the front room? Well, that was the main bedroom. That was mummy and daddy. Herman had that little room at the, at the front. Yeah, yeah. And then downstairs was that the lounge or that? We was had a lounge in the dining room downstairs and a big kitchen living room. It was a big that's the original front door on the inside through the porch. The that door, door that front door is the original. Have and did no. you have nice neighbours? Yes, but not so good. Yeah, we had nice neighbours both sides. Mr. and Mrs. Bates. With Master Bates. Mr. Slane. John Headley. John Headley. And that was um, Evelyn and that girl. And her brother was a uh, uh, winter. Uh, 